Hello friends, I'm Jill Morricone and welcome to 3ABN Sabbath School panel as we journey through the book of Hebrews in these last days. I can't believe we're at the tipping point. We're halfway through the quarter. This is lesson number seven. Jesus, the anchor of the soul. If you don't have your own copy of the quarterly, you can go to 3abnsabbathschoolpanel.com. That website again is 3abnsabbathschoolpanel.com. You can download your own copy, or we always encourage you to visit your local Seventh-day Adventist church, ask them for a quarterly, and join the Bible study there. Join us now for this edition of 3ABN Sabbath School Panel. an incredible study this has been of the book of Hebrews. I've learned so much and grown to appreciate even more our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who is our high priest, our sacrifice, and our substitute. I want to introduce to you our panel, No Strangers to You at Home. It's just so good to get in and study the Word of God with family, and that's who we are on the set. Amen. To my left is Pastor James. So glad you're here. Good to be here, Jill, always. Looking forward to your study. To your left, Pastor John Denzi. Glad you're here. It's a blessing to be here. Amen. To your left, Shelly Quinn, my sister. Glad you're here, sis. Uh, it's, I'm excited to be here. Amen. You notice everyone's talking a lot today. To your <laughs> left is Pastor Ryan Day, well, last but not least. I'll talk a little bit more. It's a blessing to be on Sabbath School Panel. I love Sabbath School Panel, and I love all of my brothers and sisters on this panel. Amen. 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 And we love you at home, too. You're part of the 3ABN Sabbath School family because you study with us every week, and we're so grateful for that. Before we go any further, we want to go to the Lord in prayer. Pastor James, would you pray for us? Absolutely. Let's pray. Father, thank you again so much for Jesus Christ. Thank you for how much this book means to us, this book of Hebrews in these last days. And thank you that we can open its pages again. We just pray that the Holy Spirit will be here with us and also with everyone who's viewing, that you will touch our hearts, that you will draw us to heaven. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. 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 So last week's lesson was an incredible study. I was so blessed by it. We studied Hebrews chapter five through seven, did we not? In just those three chapters and looked at Jesus as the faithful high priest. This week, Jesus, the anchor for the soul is really a parenthetical insertion into what we studied last week. Now you say, what in the world are you talking about, Jill? Well, I studied English. That was my degree in school. And a parenthesis is a word or a clause, something that's inserted as an explanation or an afterthought into a passage, but the passage would be grammatically complete without it. So all we're studying, the entire panel today, we're studying a parenthesis. It's this insertion into Hebrews chapters five through seven. We're gonna study Hebrews five verse 11, all the way through the end of chapter six. That is the parenthetical insertion into the theological exposition on Jesus as a high priest. Okay. So this parenthetical insertion has two portions. The first portion is a warning. It's the danger of falling away from Christ, the danger of spiritual immaturity, the danger of becoming discouraged in the journey, the danger of apostasy from God or even open rebellion against God. But it's followed, the second part of this parenthesis is encouragement. Jesus is the way of salvation. He's our hope. He is our high priest. Through him, we have immediate access to the Father. The promises given to Israel are extended to us. The hope given to Israel is given to us. You and I today can have assurance. We can have hope. We can have peace, victory, and salvation. We're going to cover all of that in this parentheses um, of Hebrews chapters 5 and 6. Our memory verse is Hebrews 6, verse 19 and 20. Let's take a look at that. Hebrews 6, verses 19 and 20. 
This hope we have is an anchor of the soul, both secure and steadfast, which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Mm. On Sunday's lesson, we tackle a passage that can be a little complicated, and I'm just doing the very first portion of it, because Pastor James and Pastor Johnny are going to cover it even more. Sunday's title is Tasting the Goodness of the Word. You know, they say that Rome wasn't built in a day. Mm. Have you heard that expression? Yep. Mm -hmm. And I would suggest to you that a marriage doesn't crumble in a day. Mm. You don't go from marital bliss to the next day, I hate you and I'm going to divorce you. Mm. Mm -hmm. It's a process to get from A to Z. It would be a process that takes time. Your child doesn't walk away from Jesus in a day. It's a process, mm -hmm. daily choices, where they're maybe in love with Jesus and all of a sudden you end up over here and say, I don't even know if I know this person mm -hmm. because they've so turned away from God. An employee of an organization is never terminated in a day. It's a process that takes much time and discussion before that decision is reached. You know, we all make choices in life. Our thoughts impact our feelings, do they not? Mm -hmm. Our feelings become our words. And our words, of course, actions and then habits and then character. And that becomes our destiny. So, you know, it starts back in the mind. We say, okay, well, you just did such and such and that became your destiny. No, our thoughts, the thoughts that we have and the feelings that we hold on to, you take that to its logical progression and you end up over here with your destiny and where it is determined. So I want to look at this passage with that in mind. We're in Hebrews 6. We're going to pick it up in verse 4. It is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift. We're going to go back and explore all of these verbs. Enlightened is the first. Tasted the heavenly gift is the second. Become partakers of the Holy Spirit. That's the third. Tasted the good word of God. That's the fourth. And the powers of the age to come. That's the fifth. If they fall away to renew them again to repentance. So let's take a look at this. The believers were converted, were they not? Mm -hmm. They were once enlightened. What does that mean? I'm reminded of Paul. This is in Acts 26, his defense. Acts 26, 17 and 18. And what does he say? Uh, this is God speaking to him. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to the power of God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Paul's really talking about the commission that he received from the Lord Jesus Christ. But what was part of that? He was to open up their eyes. It reminds me of Colossians 1 verse 13. God's delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of God's dear son. So these people were once enlightened. What does that mean? Mm. They knew God. Mm -hmm. They were enlightened. They understood. They had been transformed out of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear son. They were walking in the light of the glory of God. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't stop there. They tasted the heavenly gift. You know, mm. Psalm 34 verse 8 is a pivotal verse in my own experience mm. because of this verse I made a choice to follow Jesus. Psalm 34, verse 8 just says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen. Blessed is the man or woman who trusts in him. And because of that verse in my own life, I said, Okay, God, I'm going to try you. And I actually gave him two weeks, which I'm not sure I recommend. But I said, Two weeks. I want to see, are you real? Are your promises real? Are you a real God? Can you do what you say in the Bible? And if in two weeks you don't show yourself to me, then I'm, I'm, I'm done with you. And in those two weeks, he so revealed who he was. Mm. What was that? That was tasting God for myself. I tasted and saw that he was good. So those who have tasted of the heavenly mm -hmm. gift clearly have experienced God for themselves. Mm. Let's look at the third verb. And they tasted the heavenly gift. That's the second. The third is they became partakers of the Holy Spirit. Mm. You know, in Galatians 5 tells us when we walk in the spirit, we don't partake of the works of the flesh. Mm -hmm. If we've partaken of the Holy Spirit, clearly we're walking with God. We have the infilling of the Holy Spirit. As Shelley always talks about, pray for every day. 
the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. What's the fourth thing? They tasted of the Word of God. Mm -hmm. I'm reminded of 1 Peter 2, verses 2 and 3. Peter talking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the Word, that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. So they were enlightened by the Spirit. They partook mm -hmm. of the Spirit. They had tasted of the goodness of God. They had tasted His Word. They had walked in His Word. And then it says the power of the age to come. This refers to the miracles that God will perform for the believer in the future, mm -hmm. as well as the miracles in the present that He wants to do. And yet, in spite of all this, in spite of walking with God, in spite of knowing His Word, in spite of partaking of the Holy Spirit, you mean they're going to fall away? Mm. You mean they're going to turn away? Remember we started at the beginning? You don't go from A to Z in a day. So that decision does not happen overnight. You cannot be on fire for God, walking in the Spirit, mm. being in His Word, witnessing, tasting, and seeing that the Lord is good. And you go from here to apostasy, mm. Mm. to spiritual lethargy, to apathy, to walking away from God. There is a progression of the hardening of the heart. Yes. And I would submit to you from this passage, I see three steps in that progression. The first step is hardness of hearing mm. or the inability to listen. And where we mm. find that, we just go back a couple verses. We're in Hebrews 5. We were in Hebrews 6. Just go mm -hmm. back to Hebrews 5, verses 10 and 11. And it says, Call by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have much to say and mm. hard to explain. Why? Since mm. you became dull of hearing. Mm. That's good. When I was growing up, mm -hmm. we used to say to my dad when he was reading, he didn't hear anything else, but all he did was focus on what he's reading. Mm -hmm. And my sister and I would tease him and we would come in and we would say, hey, daddy, can we have this? Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Hey, daddy, what about this? Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Hey, daddy, what about this? Because he's not listening, right? He's reading. Mm -hmm. And then we'd always follow it up. This was our joke. We always ended with, is your head chopped off? And he would say, uh-huh. <laughs> So the truth is, we hear what we want to hear, do we not? We can be so absorbed. God wanted to explain. God wanted to tell. God wanted to teach. Mm -hmm. And they were dull of hearing. Are you dull of hearing? Have you, do you have hardness of hearing? The inability to listen? Mm -hmm. Hebrews 3, 15. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. When God speaks to your, your heart, your spirit, maybe you have walked with God for years and you've tasted and partaken of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. But if he speaks to you in a certain area of your life and you don't want to listen, you begin to harden your heart. That leads to number two. The hardness of hearing or the inability to listen leads to number two, which is the hardness of heart to obey. Mm. James 1, 22. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. This is the inability to do what you know is right. Mm -hmm. Not only are we supposed to listen when God speaks to us, we need to walk in obedience to what he tells us to do. And step number three, is the difficulty in understanding spiritual things. I believe step one and two are combined, mm -hmm. the inability to hear and the inability to obey. They're combined to form a lack of spiritual maturity. We see this in Hebrews 5 verse 12. Though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. You have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age. That is those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So what is Paul saying? Mm -hmm. He's saying here that they lack spiritual maturity and they lack spiritual discernment. And why is that? Because they began first, they neglected to listen mm -hmm. to what God tried to tell them. So my appeal to you, listen when God speaks, be open to hear his voice and be quick to obey. Amen. I really like that. I was actually taking notes right there and, and learning some things. I was really excited about getting this lesson. My name is James Rafferty and I have Monday's lesson, Impossible to Restore. And as the 
lessons were being divvied out here and there, I was looking through and thinking, which ones do I have, which ones do I have? And I landed on this one, uh, found out that also John has this one too, so we're kind of sharing it. But uh, this is a really significant one for me, and the reason why is because this is a big question as a pastor, as an evangelist, that is asked constantly. People continually point to Hebrews chapter 6 and to Hebrews chapter 10 and basically say, you know, is there any hope for me? Yeah. Is this my experience? What does this mean? If I sin, is God, there's no way I can be restored? And that's the, the title of this lesson is Impossible to Restore. Mm. Now, I came to this lesson filled with all kinds of ideas and thoughts that I was just ready to share. And then I read the lesson and I was like, Wow, <laughs> this guy knocked it out of the park. I just, I can't, I just thought this is so good. I've just, we just got to go through what's written here because it's so good. So we're going to start by just rehashing a little bit. We're going to look at Hebrews chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. Those are the verses that we're going to be covering. Hebrews 4, 6 through 8. There are a number of other verses. They kind of build this, build on this, and we'll look at those as we go through the outline. But uh, Hebrews 4, 6 through 8, let's just start with verse 4. For it is impossible... Hmm. For those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. Excuse me, I'm sorry, you said Hebrews, Hebrews 6. Hebrews 6. Oh, four through oh I'm right? sorry, Hebrews 6. Okay, yeah, we're in Hebrews, Hebrews 4. four, four okay. Yeah, it's Hebrews, Hebrews 6. 6. Four, got it? Got, thank you. Okay. Hebrews 6, 4 through 8. 6, 4 got through it. 6. All right. For it is impossible for those who are once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, all those verses that Jill just shared with us, all those phrases, if, verse 6, they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put Him to open shame. Now, there is a significance, a seriousness here when you read these verses. You think, oh, it, they should kind of grab you and they should kind yeah. of remind you of how important it is for us to hold on to the enlightenment, to the power, to everything that we've tasted of God and to not let that slip. As Jill was sharing, you know, this does this process doesn't take t place overnight. We may l it may look like it took place overnight, <laughs> but it's a long protracted process that yeah. starts in our brains. We may still put up the form of religion and going to church and doing all the things we're supposed to do, but if our heart and our mind is not connected intimately yeah. with God, mm -hmm. that process is already taking place. Right. Mm -hmm. And we know this because this is the experience of Revelation chapter 3's Laodicean church. Yeah. They are already having this experience because Jesus is on the outside knocking to come in. They're not supping with him, but they feel like they're rich and increased with mm -hmm. goods and don't need anything. They're, they're not even aware of their miserable condition. And then one day they're just going to be spewed out of the mouth of Christ. So this is significant. It's an important point that we need to look at in the book of Hebrews because the book of Hebrews is just filled with all the, the promises and the beauty of covenant relationship and our focus on Jesus as our mm -hmm. high priest and, and the better things. Mm -hmm. But then we get this right in the middle of it all. Whew, look out. What does this mean? Well, I love the way the author of the, um, of the book of Hebrews has, uh, the quarterly has uh, described this. He, he says here, the original text in the Greek emphasizes the word impossible. A lot of emphasis there. It is impossible for God to restore those who have fallen away because they are crucifying once again the Son of God. Hebrews mm. 6, verse 6. Paul wants to stress that it is, there is no other way of salvation except through Christ. Salvation by any other means is impossible as it is for God to lie, Hebrews 6, 18, to please God without faith, Hebrews 11, verse 6. Now, I want to just pause right there in the quarterly and just emphasize this point because it's so profound to me. It's so powerful. And this is really what I was going to share outside of the quarterly. And that is, is that the point that, that Hebrews is making here is not that it's impossible for us to be forgiven. It's not that it's impossible yeah. for us to have a mediator. It's, it's not that it's impossible for us to find the blood of Christ cleanses us. What the point that the author is making, that Paul is making, and of course the quarterly is making, is the impossibility is if we turn away from the mediation of Christ, mm -hmm. if we turn away mm -hmm. from the sacrifice of Jesus, if we turn away from the Holy Spirit, if we turn away right. from everything we've tasted mm -hmm. of God, there's no other means of salvation. You see, he was writing to the Hebrews and the Hebrews had trusted for 
thousands of years in the ceremonial system, mm -hmm. in the sacrifices that, that pointed to, the types that pointed to Jesus. They trusted in that. And there was this danger that they might be overwhelmed a little bit with the whole pressure of the Judaizers, yeah. or the pressure of the, the culture and that they came from and the pressure of family relationships that would draw them back into that. And Paul's saying, wait, 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 don't <laughs> go back there. I know that you've trusted that all of these years for these, for these generations, but you can't go back to that now. It's impossible for you to yeah. find salvation in that system. Mm -hmm. Don't go back to that system because you've tasted of what all that system was pointing to and you've got to stick with what it is that those things were pointing us to and not go back mm -hmm. to those symbols, those representations, so to speak. Then he goes on here in the quarterly and he says, to crucify the Son of God, again, the Son of God is a figurative expression mm -hmm. that seeks to describe something that happens in the personal relationship between Jesus and the believer. Now we're gonna get down to the nitty gritty. When the religious leaders <laughs> crucified Jesus, they did it because Jesus posed a threat to their supremacy hmm. and autonomy, okay? So here comes Jesus, he's the Messiah, he's performing miracles, he's preaching these amazing sermons, the people are gathering, <laughs> hearts are being converted, things are being turned upside down, and the religious leaders don't feel like they're the center anymore. They're not the focus anymore. They're not in charge anymore. And they haven't really put their confidence in Christ or in John the Baptist. And so Christ now becomes a threat to them. He threatens their autonomy.